And congratulations on your elections. Uh, how many months have you been in office now? Uh, it, I took office, uh, inauguration was the 1st of July. Yeah. So uh, more or less six months, how, seven how, months now. How has it been? As expected or better or worse? Well, pretty much as expected. I, ha <laughs> I, have, the, I have the advantage of uh, having spent years watching my father being yeah. president. So I had a very good idea of what it entailed. Now, of course, uh, it's different from uh, a son watching his dad uh, doing his job uh, as the, you yourself doing that job. So uh, it's, a, it's like I'm in the same uh, setting, but playing a different role. But at least I know, the, I know, I, I know what needs to be done and uh, I have a fair idea uh, how it used to be done anyway, and uh, so I have I have models that I can follow templates that I can follow But uh, in your father's time. There was no social media. No, no, no social media uh, Yes, that's that's actually in in politics I think all around the world not only in the Philippines that suddenly social media has become such an enormous force uh, Not only in politics, but in all other walks of life. So yes, that is the new feature and I think maybe we could say that the world is more complex and confrontational now uh, than uh, back when your father was well, present, and more complex in the region? Yes, because it was simpler then. Uh, for example, when you talk about foreign policy for yeah. a country like the Philippines, you choose. You were with the Americans or you were with the Soviet Union. Uh, that was still the Cold War. We were still in the midst of the Cold War. And so, yes, it was simpler then. Uh, but uh, it's uh, that kind of uh, that that kind of arrangement or that kind of uh, uh, the spheres of influence, as we used to call them, I, I don't think uh, applies anymore. However, uh, uh, we were we spoke about this uh, in another session, and uh, the forces that are sort of tending to push us back into this bipolar, I mean, not in a psychiatric sense, but bipolar world uh, is, are, are quite strong. Yeah. But I think most, uh, most uh, leaders and uh, most strategists uh, they are, 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 you know, have a consensus that we should not fall back into that, uh, that, kind, of, uh, that kind of situation where um, all countries have to choose uh, which side uh, they, will, they will be on. Uh, so when asked which side are you on, I said, well, I don't work for I don't work for Beijing. I don't work for Washington DC. I work for the Philippines. So I'm on the side of the Philippines, and that really translates into a very simple uh, statement of foreign policy, which is um, uh, I promote the national interest. And uh, the national uh, interest, uh, the national interest also. Uh, has led uh, to the fact, I think you, you've been already in Beijing and yes. visited uh, uh, President Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. uh, did your father go to Beijing? My father went to, uh, she, he would, well, I was, I have a, we have, my family has uh, quite uh, a history uh, with the People's Republic because the, in 1974, uh, I was 16 years old. My mother took her, took me with her on the first visit uh, to of uh, Filipino delegation to China, and that was the precursor to the establishment of diplomatic relations. And so after that, we met with Shou Enlai. I was uh, uh, we met with the chairman, Chairman Mao Tse Tung. Uh, and Deng Xiaoping was number three then. Uh, so we uh, that's that's how it all began. The next year. Uh, the whole, the, my, my father brought a, a formal delegation because we were unofficial with my mother. He brought a formal delegation where uh, they, set the, uh, they set the framework for the establishment of diplomatic relations between uh, the PRC and the, uh, and the Philippines. I guess it was a very different China you visited now oh, than you visited in the 1970s. Completely, completely. And it's just absolutely remarkable. Um, uh, what what we saw in China uh, in 1974, and what we saw because after that there were many visits uh, uh, subsequent to the signing, especially of the diplomatic relations, and but the the rapid 
rapid, rapid growth uh, and modernization of China is, well, is just remarkable. I think uh, the, everyone here is perfectly familiar with how that happened. But still, when you think of the time that it took them, for example, a place like Xiamen, uh, when we went to, first went to Xiamen, just a little village, even, Guan, even Guangzhou, Guangzhou was like a, it was a small it was a small city and now it's uh, you could you could be in any of the great uh, Western capitals uh, um, in terms of sophistication in terms of uh, development in terms of wealth it's uh, it has been absolutely remarkable to watch is China now your most important trading partner yes they are the largest uh, right now they are our largest trading partner and the U.S. number two or the U.S., I think, is number three now, yeah. uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, be, because the, especially since the lockdown, since the pandemic, uh, the alliances between uh, our neighbors has become very strong. For example, the uh, biggest uh, contributor for foreign direct investment now is Singapore, yeah. into the Philippines. Wow. Um, and I think the next. Uh, uh, Japan and Korea are following uh, on its heels. So it, it, it's very much a regional, because I think there has been a, a consensus amongst uh, uh, the Southeast Asian countries, Asia Pacific countries, that uh, we have to build these partnerships together. Uh, and the idea was really that uh, because of we, we need to, uh, to encourage trade and to have these partnerships because we are coming into an uncertain, uncertain uh, world with the post-pandemic uh, uh, global economy. And so those partnerships are strong. So we have, we have been very active um, in ASEAN, APEC, uh, to promote those partnerships. And uh, that's why I think uh, the, the balance in terms of trade and in terms of uh, assistance has, has, has changed uh, over the years. I was quite uh, surprised to hear that Singapore was number one on the FDI side and you said second Japan and then Korea? I think that's where we are now, yeah. but I think it's going to move. Uh, it's and going to but move. I expected maybe China among the three, but maybe many Chinese companies invest through Singapore. Yes, well, I, they invest everywhere. I mean, you know, the, 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 uh, before the before the pandemic, uh, the uh, uh, the economic activity of China in other places, because uh, because uh, they were uh, uh, with the rapid growth that they were had planned for themselves, the demand for resources, uh, mineral resources, you know, all kinds of uh, different uh, resources that they they. Uh, Cannot produce as quickly as they need it, uh, so they've gone to they've gone to other uh, other areas for their supplies. So it's been they, the same thing with the Philippines. Uh, they, uh, especially especially at that that period uh, a few years back, where China was growing at uh, 10 percent every year, uh, 10 to 12 percent. In fact, there were times there were years that they they were saying that they were posting 12 percent growth. Um, and that, that was the time that uh, China was really hungry for all the different resources. Energy, for example, uh, building materials, for example, minerals, for example, all of this uh, were, was, uh, was in high demand by the, by the Chinese economy. But it's incredible that I, I think now uh, Philippines is the fastest growing of the ASEAN countries. Of, I think in ASEAN, I think uh, we are still the fastest growing. Yeah, around seven, eight percent. But since China is also such an important market for you, how do you explain that when China now has been growing a bit slower, that mm. you have maintained or, or created such an uh, impressive growth? Because that's not the situation in the rest of the world because the, the growth has been going down. Well, it, it, it was it was a, it's a deliberate um, it was a de it's a deliberate uh, effort on our part uh, because when you we look at the alarming numbers such as uh, uh, debt to GDP ratios uh, in the Philippines, although I always say we are doing better than our neighbors, uh, the numbers is 62 percent. It is now uh, is still very high for us. So uh, the 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 strategy is to have high growth rates and to pull us out of that, that situation. And so we've done everything. First of all, the, after the pandemic or after, as we came on, as the pandemic has begun to subside, uh, the main 
concern were jobs. And that was one of the that was one of the areas, and we concentrated uh, on the MSMEs, the uh, uh, micro, uh, medium, and to medium scale enterprises, micro, small, medium scale enterprises, because that comprises such a large part of our economy, and it's it's the same in most ASEAN countries, and I think that's where the growth is coming from. Uh, so we were always very worried that. The, of the talk that we were hearing on uh, on the forecasts on the international eco on the economies uh, of different countries, and we kept hearing, especially later last year, we kept hearing about um, a recession that would be coming. So we looked very, we kept looking very closely at our unemployment rate, which is now running at 4.1, 4.2%, and and is coming is coming down. And in fact, our unemployment rate now is lower than it was before the pandemic. So we estimate that we have created uh, about 2 million jobs uh, since wow. then. So as long as the, in my, my theory, my belief, and I think I'm, I'm right in that, is that as long as the unemployment rate stays uh, low, then uh, the recessionary forces are something that we can resist. And so that's why I think that's what, that, that, that gives a good foundation for, for, the, uh, for growth. But well, what are the key growth areas? Well, we have, uh, th th let me talk about the areas that uh, did well uh, yeah. during, uh, during uh, the uh, lockdowns, uh, the strict lockdowns in the pandemic the past uh, two years. Uh, one of the businesses that uh, was proce business processing, the BPOs, uh, that uh, kept going simply because of the nature of the technology. People could work from home. Uh, the other area that has been uh, very active and continues to grow is, is mining, uh, that side of uh, the, uh, uh, the, that part of the economy. Uh, we have been a traditional exporter, a manufacturer and exporter of, semi of semiconductor products, of uh, chips, uh, and that continues to be an important factor. But the Philippines also has a very specific, uh, has a very specific advantage in that we have approximately 10 million, maybe more, uh, overseas workers uh, that, are, that are working uh, all over the world and who remit to their families. Uh, so that, that to remit, who remit uh, money to their families. And uh, that has been, in the times of really real difficulty for the economy, that has really been a, a, a buffer for us. It, it, the remittances now comprise about 9% already of, uh, of, uh, uh, of what, we, what, what, we, what the government is using to, um, uh, to fuel this growth. You also have a seven decades long uh, agreement uh, with the U.S. On, on security. Uh, is that something that you want to keep? Oh, it, it's probably, I would say, it'd be not even more than seven decades. Uh, it's been a, over a century uh, in different guises. Uh, uh, we, we, the, the, so that, that has evolved in very many ways. I mean, we started off as a commonwealth of yeah. the United States uh, earlier in the 20th century, and then further on, we gained liberation after the war, after the Second World War, 1945. So, <clears throat> and so, in that, but the, the, the connection between the Philippines and the United States has remained strong. Uh, and we are their only treaty partner in Asia. Uh, and so that, 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 is, that has grown stronger and stronger, but uh, it has to, I always say that uh, we can, the only way for it to remain strong and to remain relevant is to evolve that relationship. So it can no longer be uh, simply a, uh, what, what it was before. Uh, and the, the, the Philippines has changed, the United States has changed, the world has changed, and now uh, we are living within the context of all of these other forces that are coming out, uh, especially around the region, around South China Sea. So uh, again, uh, to be able to respond properly, we have to evolve these relationships. And uh, the, the, I, I have to say that uh, it continues to go. We, pro we, we, we are progressing along that evolution very well. Um, and uh, we are able to continue, not only in terms of, uh, in terms of trade, 
uh, and in terms of uh, diplomatic uh, <coughs> relationship. Uh, but beyond that, is, uh, there is, we have security arrangements with the United States, uh, and that, have, that has come to the forefront, whereas perhaps we, we were a bit on the back burner for a little while. That has, again, come to the forefront because of the increased tensions in our part of the world. Yeah, and you mentioned the South China Sea. Is that something that keeps you up at night? It's, uh, we, the South China Sea situation, yes. is that something that keeps you up at night? Keeps you up at night, it keeps you up in the day, keeps you up uh, <laughs> most of the time. It's something, it keeps, it, 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 it's very, it's very dynamic. It, uh, it's, uh, it's constantly in flux. Uh, so you have to pay attention to it and to make sure that uh, uh, you, are, you are at least aware of uh, the present situation so that uh, uh, you are able to respond properly. So it, uh, it's, we, 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 in terms of, let's say, cross-strait tensions, we are at the very, we're at the very front line. Uh, we are at the very front line. And, and uh, so whenever these tensions increase, when the ships come out, uh, the Chinese send their Coast Guard vessels, the Americans answer, we, we, we are watching as bystanders and said, if something goes wrong here, we're, we, we, we are going to suffer. And that's why uh, the, uh, when asked what is your foreign policy and what, how would you describe it, I say it's a commitment to peace and a, uh, uh, a very, and hewing very, very close and guided very, very closely by our national interests, as I mentioned before. Well, did, um, if I may, did the South China Sea uh, complex come up in your conversations in Beijing with the oh, President yes. Xi Jinping? There, there is no way to avoid it. <laughs> uh, there is no way to avoid it. We, we, uh, we describe it um, in, uh, in, I suppose, in diplomatic language as, uh, um, as one part of our relationship, but it is an important and unavoidable uh, issue that we have to, uh, we have to ventilate and we cannot uh, so put it up, uh, sweep it under the rug and pretend it's not happening because uh, there are effects uh, not only in the diplomatic sense, not only in the security sense, but even in the livelihood of our, uh, of our citizens. So uh, it, is, it is unavoidable to, to speak about that. And it, I, I would not be doing my job if I did not bring up these issues with President Xi when I had the opportunity. And uh, w what is your main concern related to this? Is that, uh, uh, is that these islands or is it uh, your fishing vessels or is it uh, the principles for what <laughs> defines what yeah. is uh, Filipino territory and what is Chinese territory? All of the above. Okay. All of the above. Uh, the, all of Did the, I miss anyone? All of those issues are 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 open issues uh, right now. Uh, so the in terms in terms of uh, the territorial, let's say that uh, we have no uh, conflicting claims with China. What we have is China making claims on our territory, and that is our that is our. Uh, uh, that's, that is how we approach uh, the problem that we find. Uh, because we established, uh, we've established our baselines. Uh, they were, the, the, the baselines as was, as was drawn out uh, was given to uh, the UN and UNCLOS uh, uh, has accredited that, the, those baselines as the baselines of the Philippines. Uh, and we lived with them for a, many, many years without a problem. Uh, and suddenly uh, things had changed. Uh, so I suppose uh, China has some uh, strategic concerns that uh, have caused them to do this. So it is, uh, again, uh, we are always, I, I, I feel if you have been listening to the ASEAN uh, pronouncements, it is always the rule of law. Uh, it is always UNCLOS that we talk about because it's not only the Philippines who has these uh, issues with China. Uh, amongst the ASEAN members, and so uh, that that is the that is the the approach. I mean, some people say uh, even within within the Philippines that we should do more. And I said, what do you want to do? Go to war? Nobody wants to go to war. We don't. China doesn't. The United States doesn't. So, but the just having the tensions the tensions increase in the region already has an effect on uh, on on trade. 
on all of the exchanges that we have uh, within uh, ASEAN, uh, within the region, with China, with the United States, and now with the aggrupations that are being formed uh, with Australia, with Japan, with South Korea. Uh, once again, uh, these, are, these are the uh, elements that now have made the situation there very, very dynamic, very, very complex. And uh, we are hoping to simplify them as much as possible if we can. But they are not simple problems, and they are, they are no, and they are, because of that, there are no simple solutions. Um, so, and there are players uh, that come in from everywhere, from Europe, the United States. Uh, the, um, so that, that, uh, that, is, that is what we have to deal with in the region. However, there is also a unanimity of the belief amongst the leaders in ASEAN that uh, we must be committed to the idea that of, we call it Asian centrality, but it essentially boils down to the idea that the future of the region must be decided by the region. It cannot be decided by outside forces, by outside powers. And I think that has, uh, that has been a good guide yeah. for, for uh, uh, the foreign policy and our dealings with the superpowers. Uh, you, you see, Japan has now committed to double uh, their defense, defense spending uh, yes. budget from one yeah. percent of GDP to two percent of GDP. Is that something you ran on too on your ticket, or is that something that you're reflecting on uh, in the Philippines? Well, I think uh, to an extent, but not uh, because the, the the belief is that first of all, there is no point. Uh, the Philippines building up its armory. First, the, the, we, we, we are not in a, in a, in a, in a uh, economic situation that we are able to build up to the levels that the, the Americans have, to the levels that the Chinese have. And more importantly, perhaps, is the, our abiding belief that uh, the solutions are not going to be military. And if they are going to be military, then they are not solutions because uh, uh, this will, it will end badly. If it goes that way, it will end badly for everyone involved um, and even those who are not involved. And when I say that, I'm thinking of, uh, of the war in Ukraine. Uh, we, we were quite, I think all of us were quite surprised, especially us in the Philippines, to think that the war in Eastern Europe would affect agriculture in the Philippines. And, I guess it just goes to show how well connected that is. But uh, like I say, if a similar situation um, would arise in the region, then uh, it would be, actually, I, I would say it would be disastrous for, for the rest of the world as well. Not only for, for the region, but for the rest of the world. Now, as you said, Mr. President, uh, the way you see it is a territorial claim on your territory mm -hmm. that has uh, been uh, agreed on. So uh, was there any understanding for that perspective when you were in Beijing? Well, the, the, uh, well we st when, when I spoke to President Xi, I, I, I prefaced our discussion by saying we are not going to decide here today uh, the issues that are between the Philippines and, um, and, and, uh, and China in terms of territoriality. And so I chose to raise subjects, uh, to raise issues that have a good uh, possibility of actually being resolved. Uh, and these are this, uh, the incidents that have, uh, that have been happening in the South China Sea be between our Coast Guard, between the Chinese Coast Guard, between our fishing boats, uh, and of course, uh, every so often, the American vessels, the, the American Navy that comes in. Um, when they feel that they have to project uh, a presence in the, in the area. So, uh, the, so the, that, uh, that, that, that uh, precludes uh, uh, the possibility of just uh, saying, look, we come to an agreement uh, between the two of us and uh, uh, we will, we will uh, take away all the issues there. Uh, as, uh, as we keep coming back to uh, the fact that it has become terribly complex and very, very dynamic and uh, uh, requires a good deal of attention. Mr. President, coming back to uh, the economic potential 
uh, of the Philippines. As you said, um, you have a young population. You also saw during uh, the lockdowns that there were uh, possibilities to work from home. Mm -hmm. People are uh, tech savvy. If you look at, for example, like South Korea uh, and other nations in the region, mm -hmm. they've leapfrogged uh, uh, from a certain mm -hmm. point. Do you see a possibility now in the years to come that the Philippines can really leapfrog and, and take the, the, the step into a situation where you, you could follow some of your most successful neighbors? Well, we sincerely hope so, and I think that is a distinct possibility, um, simply because we also hold a great deal of, uh, we also uh, recognize a great deal of potential in the new technologies in terms of, of course, the, in the economy. And uh, the advantage that we have, that, that the new tech has, is that it is not like the traditional industries where you have to slowly build it up over the years. Uh, you come, uh, you, have a, you, have an, you have a problem, you engage uh, new technologies and bring it on, uh, bring it on. and uh, you, don't, you don't need to buy second-hand technology. You can buy the state-of-the-art immediately. So that's the leapfrog, is you come from no uh, very old tech and you go straight to uh, the cutting edge of technology. So uh, that, I think, uh, that is also, I think, what uh, South Korea is, uh, was, uh, one, was the first uh, highly digitalized uh, country in Asia and followed by uh, uh, many of our other neighbors in, in ASEAN. It, uh, it is a central tenet of uh, the development strategy of ASEAN and of all the member countries in ASEAN. Mm. Well, what, what do you think are the main obstacles today that you will look at? Is it infrastructure? Is it quality of mm. uh, education? Is it R&D? Is it red tape? Is it taxes? Uh, <laughs> is it uh, fiscal uh, stability or all about? I, I guess it's a little, <laughs> again, all of the above. But what, I, what, what, what the, our, the approach that the Philippines has taken is, uh, is our lessons learned, the hard lessons learned from the lockdown, from the pandemic, from the height of the pandemic, where it became very, very clear where the weaknesses were. Uh, in terms, for example, we talked about agriculture, in terms of agricultural production, in terms of distribution, uh, in terms of supply and pricing as well. Uh, the, the areas in infrastructure, I think uh, we have made the commitment and I'm confident that uh, with that commitment and we follow through on that commitment that uh, our infrastructure development will, will proceed apace and that that is something that we have uh, control over simply because these are government projects and we are again uh, promoting uh, PPPs even in the uh, especially in the infrastructure projects because they're these are big ticket con these are big ticket uh, programs uh, so that is uh, that is one uh, one area the other ones the, the in my view uh, are the um, for example are the, are the systems and that we have in place. And the bureaucracy has a part to play in this because the bureaucracy is, uh, is, has been formed to respond to a different kind of economy and a different kind of uh, eco uh, global economy as well. Uh, so that one, that, that, that structural changes in the bureaucracy, for example, have to, they're quite painful changes as well. Uh, have to be have to be made, and that is part of it. Digitalization is going to play a large part in that process. Uh, so, uh, again, but the on the plus side, uh, what when when I am asked why why are you so optimistic about the future, and I always say you know when uh, when there is uh, when what what we have been given is that people say we have to recover you know we got into this debt hole and we have to dig ourselves out of it and i say i don't really see it the same way what i see is that we are reforming reshaping the global economy and that gives us an opportunity uh, it's not a clean sheet of paper but maybe half clean sheet of paper where we can we can still uh, design and draw uh, uh, put down our ideas for what the, the global economy should look like. So, and the reason that uh, I'm very, very optimistic and very confident uh, of the future 
And uh, in fact, uh, we we have a, a, a sort of bet going with uh, uh, Madame Georgina of the IMF. Okay. Uh, in terms of, they they predict a growth rate of five percent for the Philippines, and we said, well, our our projection is six and a half, and we're still hoping that it will it will be it we will be able to grow beyond that. And the reason that I'm so confident about that is because we have this workforce. We have a very very good workforce in the Philippines. Um, we, we have the youngest workforce in, uh, in Asia. Uh, I, you might be surprised to know, to learn, that the average age of a, a Filipino worker is 23 and a half years old. Uh, so that is a huge uh, demographic dividend. Uh, but demographic dividend is not paid out just as a matter of course. You have to develop you have to develop now what some of the, some of the uh, concepts that we keep hearing about are, is upskilling and reskilling, and that's we have concentrated on. But again, uh, the, the, the raw material in terms of, in terms of our workforce is uh, very, very uh, advantageous. Uh, they are, uh, they, the, our workforce is well trained. Our uh, workforce is sophisticated, very uh, and and uh, English speaking, uh, uh, quite uh, uh, in terms of technology. I, I would say that uh, we are on equal footing as any other uh, as any other uh, uh, country. So that is where my confidence comes from, and that uh, that is the confidence that I hope to exude sufficiently to bring that confidence also to all of you and all of our potential partners in the in the in the world no thank you it's been a fascinating uh, discussion uh, I guess uh, just to to run um, uh, off uh, ho how many years is it since your father left office 34 34 in 1986 uh, we left the Philippines in 1986 so uh, did, did did you expect to come back as a president of your country? Not as president. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it, it, we, were, we were in exile for six years, so uh, we weren't sure if we were coming back at all, uh, physically coming back. My father never made it back. He died in Hawaii. Uh, so that, yes, uh, that, that, was a very, uh, uh, that was a very trying time. Uh, those were dark days for the family. Um, and I dare say, even for the country. But uh, but you didn't uh, you didn't have an ambition to to become a president of your country back then. Well, uh, I, I I need to explain this uh, this to people that one uh, as I was going uh, coming out of schooling out of university, I did I avoided politics. Uh, I was determined not to go into politics. I said, why will I go into politics? My father has done everything in politics, and the life is difficult. And I could see the sacrifices that they had to make, that he had to make to get to, to do a good job. And I said, yeah, yeah maybe that's not, no, that's not what, uh, uh, that's not what uh, I'm meant to be doing. Uh, but after we came back from the United States, after, after exile, when we were first allowed to come back, the political issue was Marcos. And for us, we, for us to defend ourselves politically, somebody had to enter politics and be in the political arena so that at least not only the legacy of my father, but even uh, our, own, uh, our own survival required that somebody go into politics. And so upon arrival in 91, the following election was in 92, I immediately ran for uh, congressman in our province and House of Representatives. And, you know, uh, uh, like I always say, it's not where this is. If you had asked me when I was 23, 24, 25 years old, will you enter politics? Before you finished asking the question, I've already said no, <laughs> no, no, no. But, you know, life takes you to certain, to, 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 to places that you did not expect. Uh, and so once I, once I, I was uh, entrenched <laughs> in the political arena, I said, well, we, if you're going to do this, you better do it well. You better be president. Well, you, you, every, every, every 
a lieutenant wants to be a general, right? Every, uh, um, uh, every clerk wants to be uh, the CEO. Uh, so I'm saying if I'm going to be in politics, let's do the best we can and take it as far as we can take it. So we just never stop. But, uh, you know, this is, your, this is your career now, so work hard at it and uh, do it well. Do it as the best that you can. And I was blessed uh, that uh, the Filipino uh, the voting uh, population, the, vo the voters, uh, Filipino voters, uh, agreed with the message that we put out during the campaign and uh, returned, uh, uh, returned a very strong mandate for the presidency. No, uh, congratulations on that. And also, thank you for sharing uh, this with us here today. And thank you for coming to Davos. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. You, Mr. President. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.